The Moore Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The Moore Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. The Moore Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. The comments and views expressed on The Moore Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect the view of Kevin Moore, The Moore Show, or this radio station and its affiliate or sponsors. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Broadcasting live from the UK and across the world online, you're now listening to the UK's only live alternative late night talk show. I'm Kevin Moore. For the next three hours, I'll be covering subjects that will open up your mind and provide you with information you may have never heard before. On tonight's show, I'll be joined by Maurice Cotterell, who's a best-selling author, engineer and a scientist. His work has best been described as adventure fact, brings together modern science, spirituality and ancient wisdom to unlock the secrets of the past and the science of the future. On the second half of the show, I'll be speaking to lucid dreamer Robert Ragnar. Robert has taught himself how to lucid dream or realise within a dream that he's dreaming. Since then, Robert has logged more than 1,000 lucid dreams and is considered an expert on the subject. So stay tuned to find out more. Now this is a live show, so you may call in at any time in the show to speak to the guest or share your opinion. Call us on 0292-000-3666 or text your comments and questions to 07728 758 759. International listeners outside the UK may Skype the show by adding The More Show Live or you may choose to interact with us on Facebook and Twitter. Now we are live every Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday from 1am to 4am British Summer Time. Uh, that's Monday, Wednesday and Friday, 8pm to 11pm Eastern Daylight Time in America. I'm now joined with Maurice Cotterell, who's a best-selling author, engineer and scientist. In 1989, Maurice found a way of calculating the duration of long-term magnetic reversals on the sun. Using this knowledge, he was able to break the codes of ancient sun-worshipping civilizations. First the mines of Central America, those of Tutankhamun of Egypt, and the, very, and the Vericoches of South America, before breaking the codes of the terracotta warriors of China and the Celts of Europe. His research explains how the 28-day spinning sun regulates fertility in females, how it determines personality of the fetus in the womb, known also as sun sign astrology. It explains how sun causes schizophrenia, how mobile phones and overhead power lines cause cancer, and how VDUs, TVs and computer screens, cause miscarriages. And it explains how the sun brings periodic, periodic catastrophic destruction to Earth. His own unique decoding process reveals amazing pictures from archaeological treasures that explain the spiritual mysteries of life, why we are born, why we die, and why this has to be. His work, best described as adventure facts, brings together modern science, spirituality, and ancient wisdoms to unlock the secrets of the past and the science of the future. Wow. Oh, wow. These sound really deep and fascinating. Good morning, Maurice. Good morning, Kevin. Now, I know you're not feeling too well right now, so I really appreciate you joining us tonight, or That's this okay. morning. That's okay. So, Maurice, just very quickly, uh, have you uh, always had a sort of spiritual background as a scientist? I've always had a spiritual background since about the age of eight, when I used to go to church on my own. 
And, and is that compatible as a scientist, do you think? Absolutely. I think science and spirituality are two sides of the same coin. Yeah, yeah. But do, do, you, um, do you think that's, that's influenced the way your work's gone with, 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 with your latest book, Forbidden Science? Yeah, it's very difficult to predict the path one's going to take through life uh, beforehand. Uh, very often, we wish to take certain paths, but certain paths are blocked, if you like, and we can't go that direction. So fate deals us a hand which sends us in a different direction. Uh, I actually uh, went to uh, naval college when I left school for three years, and I studied to be a communications officer on board ship. Uh, that was how I was entitled to be registered as, uh, with the Institute of Engineering and Technology as an electrical and communications engineer. So I sailed off around the world, and uh, I noticed very early on several problems. For example, in the communications field, the further we got from the UK on shortwave, the more disruption we would experience from the sunspot cycle, which was at a maximum at that time. But there were also very subtle differences I noticed on board ship. For example, when the ship was sailing from north to south, the crew were quite happy, but when we were sailing from east to west, they got very agitated. Now, I started to bring all of this stuff together and uh, try to question how different directions could affect the brain and the hormone system in humans and how the sunspot cycle may influence uh, the human psyche. In fact, my first trip to sea, we, went, we sailed off to China, and uh, I was introduced to the 12-year astrological si cycle of the Chinese. And then I considered, that, considered perhaps that the 11-and-a-half-year sunspot cycle and the 12-year astrological cycle of the Chinese was some way related. And so I started to pursue that line of inquiry. And uh, in fact, I decided that it, they were connected. And uh, many years later, I was working at Cranfield University, with the largest computer in the, in the country at the time. And I decided to try and calculate the sunspot cycles. Modern science said it couldn't be done, but it, it could be done, and it, I did it. And it's quite straightforward once you get your head around it. But uh, science, uh, scientists maintain that you, the sunspot cycle cannot be calculated because there are three variables. The sun is quite complex. It's a ball of spinning plasma, which is like a superheated st sticky gas. And uh, it spins on its axis, just like the Earth spins. The Earth spins every 24 hours, and the Sun spins every 28 days to an observer on Earth. That's at the equator of the Sun. The polar regions actually spin a lot slower. It takes 40 days if you're at the North Pole or the South Pole of the Sun compared to the Earth. This is known as the differential rotation of the Sun's magnetic fields. And once I started to study the Sun and its effect on the Earth, uh, I, I found a mechanism uh, to explain how astrology works, and I discovered that the 28-day spinning sun regulates the fertility cycle in females. Uh, this is why uh, the 28-day uh, spinning sun regulates the amount of oestrogen and progesterone produced by females. So all of this stuff started to come together over the years, and it wasn't really that I chose to discover it. I was getting quite frustrated. For many years, I considered that somebody somewhere should figure out how astrology works but it seemed that nobody ever was going to do that. And so eventually I finished up doing it myself. And the same goes for the sunspot cycle, the same goes for gravity, the same goes for a whole host of discoveries that came later. Uh, and they just snowballed, one followed the next. And I was led into each discovery by the previous one. OK, OK. Well, let's go straight into your work and let's cover some of those uh, subjects in more depth that you've just um, uh, been talking about there. So, you know, your book, Future Science, uh, explains, I suppose, what God is, what heaven is, what hell is, uh, you know, why we live, why we die. Um, and what you refer to as the, as, as the 12 great mysteries of physics, which you then go on to... Um, go into more detail on, you know, can you explain uh, uh, what these are to our listeners, these, these, these 12 uh, great mysteries of physics to begin with? Absolutely. And I'd like to say before I start that any 10-year-old can understand what's going to come next. So don't be put off by science. It's easy. Uh, my view on science is that uh, physics is a complete fraud. It's a complete scam. And most people don't realize that they know more about the scientists of today anyway. So don't feel too bad about it. The problem is these guys walk around in their white coats and most people see our civilization of today as scientifically advanced, when in fact we're very primitive. 
scientists understand very little of the world we see around us. For example, they don't understand why the smallest bundle of matter, the atom, is stable. For example, they don't understand why the positive protons in the middle of an atom don't just spring apart, which is what you'd expect given that positive repels positive. They don't understand why the orbiting negative electrons don't get sucked into the atom and annihilate themselves because negative should be attracted to positive. They don't understand why the negative particles op orbit the atom in eight different shells, or why the shells are offset by at least 45 degrees to each other, or why the shells contain the number of negative charges that they do. They don't understand the purpose of the neutron inside the atom, the non-charged particle found inside most atoms, and not so, uh, uh, for the most part, they just disregard it because it's neutral. Now, given that nobody understands how the atom works, it comes as no surprise to find out that nobody understands why objects fall to the ground. And as so often happens in science, when nobody understands something, they give it a name, like gravity, in the hope that the question will go away. The fact is nobody understands what causes gravity. Scientists do not understand how a permanent magnet works. They don't understand why a magnet sticks to the fridge of your door, the door of your fridge, excuse me. And they don't understand how electricity works. They don't understand why a magnetic field appears around a wire when an electric current flows. They have no idea how electromagnetism or even a doorbell actually work. Astrophysicists don't understand why the galaxies are spiral-shaped or why stars cluster. And they don't understand what causes the sunspot cycle, global warming and global cooling. They don't understand why the middle of the Earth is red hot. Uh, and all of these uh, are explained in future science very simply to any 10-year-old, and it's very, very straightforward. Well, um, wh why, why do you think that, you know, you've found some of these answers then? I mean, is, is that because you've, uh, you, you have a more open mind in a sense? Well, I was born at the right time uh, for technology, for, a, for example. Uh, I couldn't have done what I did for example, without the computer and without photocopy machines, without calculators. So I, was, I came at the right time in the right place, so that was a bonus. Uh, in regard to figuring out the problem of gravity, first of all, it was clear that there's something wrong with the atom, so I had to address all of the problems with the atom and figure out what was going on. Present-day understanding of the construction of the atom can be seen I don't know if you've got the illustrations up on your screen, Kevin. We you? do. We do indeed. Excellent. Okay. Well, if you look at the top of the illustration with the red protons, we've got the black electrons, which are negative, and the blue-green neutrons, the neutral particles. In order to make the atom stable, I had to change the shape of the neutron so that the neutron-positive and neutron-negative particles inside the neutron don't short-circuit each other. And it was, if we go back, it was in 1960 that they smashed two of these neutrons together. Until that time, they didn't know what was inside a neutron. And it was then that they realized that there was a, a small negative particle, a small positive particle, and a small neutral particle. And, of course, because they cancel each other out and they're neutral, they just ignored them. Now, the only way we can stop the neutral negative particle inside the neutron and the neutron positive particle from shorting out is to stick the green particle in the middle of them to keep them apart. So that's the first thing I had to do, is to make the neutron a viable component, if you like. And what we see is I took them out of the spherical uh, representation, put them in a longitudinal relationship, one the negative on the left, positive on the right. Then I changed the negative to a negative battery-type symbol and the positive to a positive battery-type symbol. And they were both separated by the neutron. Uh, negative. Now if we reassemble the atom and put the spiked neutron, that's what I call these now, not, not spherical neutrons, but spiked neutrons, if we put them back in the atom now, it's a bit like a chestnut shell. And what we see is that the negative tips of the spiked neutrons repel the orbiting electrons. And the positive tips of the spiked neutrons compress the positive protons in the middle of the atom. So the spiked neutrons in this configuration make the atom stable because it, it's like they behave like springs. They keep the electrons and the protons separated. So that was the first thing I had to do. And uh, now that's so simple, people can't believe that. They say, well, why couldn't scientists do that? Well, they couldn't do it because they, ignore what was in, they ignored what was inside the neutron from 1960 onwards. The next thing I had to do, having uh, 
established that the, the uh, shape of the neutron was wrong was have a look at the shape of the electron. And uh, uh, I, I've got a diagram together which shows a hydrogen atom being orbited by a coil-shaped electron. Now, Ernest Rutherford, in the 1920s, he imagined the negative particles to be negative signs, just like we have positive and negative. And that's how he drew them in representations of his atom, as we saw in the previous diagram. What I've done is I've changed the shape into a coil. Now, that makes the atom dynamic. So as the coil uh, orbits the hydrogen proton, it uh, cuts through the electric field between the two particles. This causes magnetism to be established in the coil, the orbiting coil-shaped electron. That causes the uh, electron to twist vertically. And as it goes around the atom, it topples uh, like uh, a toppling uh, uh, wind, wind, windmill, if you like. And uh, what we see is that uh, once we put this down on paper, what we can see is that the electric particle, the electron, becomes magnetic when it's vertical on the left, then it becomes electric again at the top when it's horizontal, then it becomes magnetic again on the right, and then it becomes electric again on the bottom. Okay. So it's changing from positive to negative. So this turns science upside down because they believe that the electron is an electric particle, but it's not. It's only electric for half the time, and it's pos uh, magnetic for half the time. And then if we study that little diagram a little bit more, what we see is as it orbits the, the middle of the, okay. the hydrogen proton, it radiates a corkscrew magnetic wave. Okay, now, now you have to understand, uh, uh, you, you've gone straight in there, so very deep as well. And, uh, you know, my background, uh, I'm pleased to say, is, is, is it was electronic servicing but way back in the day. Um, uh, and I, you know, I used to find all this stuff very, very fascinating. Um, but uh, you've lost me a little bit there. I've got, I've got to say that. But that's okay. Okay, I um, probably want to listen back to this in the future. I'll be like, oh, I get it now. <laughs> there's, there's a, there's a lot to take in there. Okay, so obviously you've, uh, you know, you've, you're well researched into this. And what we're going to do is just after the ad break, we're going to go into the uh, a little bit more into the twelve great mysteries of physics as well. Uh, and and um, stay tuned. Tuned, and we'll be right back after this short break. The Moore Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. Visit themoreshow.co.uk forward slash shop to purchase products and services from your favourite past guests. If you're new to this site, you can also catch up on the previous television and radio shows through YouTube and the Moore Show website. The Moore Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. Welcome back to the show. I'm still currently joined by my guest, Morris Cotterell. Uh, Morris, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much, Kevin. Now, Morris, I believe we've got a caller uh, online too that just wants to ask a quick question. Uh, uh, Donald, are you there? I'm here. Hi, Donald. Good morning. Uh, what's your question to uh, Maurice, please? Maurice, I have a theory I, uh, that has come to me that seems obvious, but nobody has ever mentioned it or said it anywhere that I've read or heard, and I wanted to get your feedback. And uh, this is a question that brings a lot of the theory you're talking about back to our human lives. And that is, it seems to me that mental energy is electric and emotional energy is magnetic. Electric energy, uh, mental energy is fast moving, doesn't last very long. By itself, it's not very substantial. Magnetic energy is, is more substantial, uh, like emotional energy, and that, you know, for things to really happen, you need to have both so that when a person's mental energy is interacting with its emotional energy, it's generating positive electromagnetism. But I haven't found this in any books anywhere, but it seems like a no-brainer. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it's a very interesting concept, Donald. Uh, I do have my own ideas on this, and I believe that we're very complex creatures. For example, we have an emotional body, which is the heart, an intellectual body, which is the mind, a physical body, which is the physical body, and a spiritual body, which is the soul. 
And these operate under different conditions and in different ways. For example, in the physical world where the physical body, body lives, uh, for example, if I have a pound coin and you have a pound coin and we exchange them, we finish up with a pound each. We can't get something for nothing. But in the intellectual world, if I have an idea and you have an idea and we exchange them, then we both finish up with two ideas and it doesn't cost us anything. And it seems to me that in the emotional world, if I love you, then my voltage, my soul voltage will go up. And if my soul voltage goes up, then when my body dies, and my soul leaves my body, it goes back to God, and God grows by the increased voltage. So that, that, that is a model that I've learned excuse me, from the sun-worshipping civilizations around the world, the ancient Mayas, <coughs> the Egyptians, the Chinese, the Celtic people, and the Peruvians. But, I mean, I can't say that your model is, is, is unworthy. I mean, it's an interesting concept, although why the heart would be purely magnetic and why the brain would be purely electrical is not altogether clear at this, this part, part of the discussion because we would have to look at the memory. And if we're looking at the mind as electrical, then we've got problem with storage because the only storage we know uh, in the present day, our present day storage is magnetic, although this is changing, I agree. We're getting down to resistive memories now. Uh, but uh, you can't have the electric without the magnetic because it depends on the atom. You know, the atom is electric for half the time and magnetic for half the time. It would be very difficult to separate these two, two components of energy inside the body. So it would be something I would have to be persuaded of before I accepted it. Okay, well, uh, Donald, thank you very much for calling us. So, um, okay, well, let's let's go straight into it then. You know, you mentioned no one under understands how gravity works, and you know, prior to this, uh, prior to the ad break, you were going. Well, you you you, know, you re refer to some of the twelve great mysteries. But before we move on, ha did we miss out any of the 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 twelve? I mean, do we do we get do we discuss most of them or? Uh, we did actually. They're very straightforward, and uh, as I said, Kevin, it's people should not get afraid of this stuff. It's ten year old stuff. It really is. You know, there's nothing difficult about it once you get your head around it. On the 12 Great Mysteries, we, first of all, four of the mysteries are what makes the atom stable. Why don't the positive bits in the middle spring apart? Why don't the negative bits get sucked into the middle? Uh, why does it, uh, the atom have a certain number of shells? Why are those shells arranged as they are? So that's four of the mysteries. Scientists don't understand any of that stuff. They're totally perplexed by it. Well, if you can't understand how the atom is made, how on earth can you understand how a collection of a atoms, like an apple, will fall off a tree and hit the ground? Mm. You can't. So you've got to figure out how the atom works first. Then you can figure out how gravity works by looking at the hydrogen atom, the simplest of atoms, because I know that 93% of the atoms in the universe are hydrogen, and they give off I've discovered that they give off corkscrew-style radio waves, electric and magnetic, and it's these corkscrew waves that pull objects towards them. So, again, it all becomes very straightforward once you redesign the atom. Right, right. And the same goes for the other mysteries, like how does permanent magnetism work, how does electricity work, why does a magnetic field appear when, we, when a current flows, why do stars cluster, why a, spir a galaxy is spiral-shaped, what drives a sunspot cycle, what causes global warming and global cooling. All of these are answered once we change the shape of that very basic, fundamental, 10-year-old atom. Okay, okay. And, and, and again, before we just move on, how, has, how, has, how have your peers reacted to your work as well? I mean, this is, uh, like you say, it's, uh, you know, future science, isn't it? It took me six weeks to figure this stuff out in 2007, Kevin, but it took me three years to find a way of explaining it. Uh, and in 2010, I wrote a paper, which is on my website for people to download so you can, for free, so you can have a look at the pictures. They're all JPEGs, and there's a PDF file as well. Very straightforward. Uh, the UK Institute of Engineering and Technology accepted how gravity works for deposit in their research paper database. But as they explained to me at the time, they are not the governing body for subjects concerning, concerning physics. So they suggested I send the paper to the UK Institute of Physics in London. But they refused anyone to read the paper on the grounds that they gave three reasons. There was nothing in it they had been working on because it was completely new yeah. and because it contained no mathematics. Okay. It was just too easy for everybody to understand. 
Okay. Okay. Well, let's go into it. Let's go into gravity then, in your opinion. Uh, so okay. In the last illustration, I think it was, we looked at the magnetic wave coming off the, the electron as it orbited the hydrogen atom. And what we see now with this illustration is the capacitance cycle of the hydrogen atom. And a similar thing happens. As the electron orbits the atom, it gives off a corkscrew-style electric wave. And the box on the right shows the electron changing as it orbits from an electric particle to a magnetic particle, then back to an electric particle, then back to a magnetic particle. And this is the key to understanding gravity, because what's happening is, as hydrogen orbits, as a hydrogen electron orbits the hydrogen atom, it gives off corkscrew waves that strike neighboring atoms, and it causes the neighboring atom to spin in the same direction. And the electrons are synchronized in the neighboring atom with those of the hydrogen atom. And what that means is, if you put a load of atoms together, is that it's the magnetic moments from the spinning electrons in different atoms that bring the atoms together, what we call gravity. And it's as simple as that. Again, I, I urge listeners to go to my website, download the paper, How Gravity Works. It's only eight or nine pages. The diagrams are very, very simple. There's 143 diagrams in Future Science. Okay. And as I say, it's designed for 10-year-olds. There's nothing difficult about it. Okay. It's only difficult if it's wrong to begin with. And that's the problem we have with modern science. Yeah. It's wrong to begin with. It imagines that the electron is an electric particle when it's not. It's only electric for half the time. And uh, what about things like anti-gravity? Can you go there? Anti-gravity, that's explained in the book. What we find is that uh, as the hydrogen atom spins, it gives off this corkscrew wave, and that brings atoms together. Well, if you delay the wave and reverse it so that it's opposite to the gravity wave, then what we get is anti-gravity. And instead of pulling things to bits, it separates things. So, for example, if you bombard a glass of water with anti-gravity, the bonding of the hydrogen and the oxygen atoms fail, and the atoms separate, so we get oxygen, free oxygen on one side, and free hydrogen on the other side, which means that we can generate unlimited free energy by burning hydrogen in cars and other machines, and we get free oxygen as well, simply by generating a gravity wave from a bunch of hydrogen atoms okay. and then reversing the phase of the wave. And that's as simple as it is. OK, well, we have another caller on the line, I believe. Uh, Rhys, are you there? I am indeed. Hello. Hello, Rhys. What's your question, please? Well, um, I, I, I should say um, uh, that I am a mathematician and physicist. Um, so uh, thanks for the comments about us knowing nothing. A uh, great morale boost for all of us scientists out there. Uh, I'm also uh, an engineer and a member of the Institution of Engineering and Technology, uh, which uh, Morris himself said he was a member. So I'd be interested to know if he's still a member after uh, what he's been saying on his, uh, in his book and uh, on the radio this evening. My, my main point out of what's been discussed so far is, uh, Morris, you talk about these... You talk about the fact that uh, scientists don't fully understand the structure of the atom. Well, that's true, uh, but we do know that it's correct. There is scientific evidence which shows that it's correct. Just because we don't understand it doesn't mean that the structure is incorrect. Now, while you might have what you think is a theory, uh, which without going into any details of it, um, and I'm not a theoretical uh, or atomic physicist, um, may, may well have no more or less merit than any other theory, you don't appear to be giving us any evidence for this. All you've got is you've, you've, you've taken some effects and you've come up with a theory which might explain it. That's the, that's the hypothesis, okay. the first step in the scientific process. Okay, Mor Morris, what do you have to say about that? Uh, well, Rhys, uh, I am still a member of the IET. Uh, I uh, correspond with them on a regular basis. I'm dealing here with the first uh, 20 pages of the book. The book's got 250 pages in it. Uh, once we get the hydrogen atom right and uh, we get the atom right, all of the 12 great mysteries of science are answered. Now, with your atom or the orthodox structure of the atom, you say it's right. It is not right, I can assure you. There is no evidence for saying it's right. Uh, it's a farce. Well, the well, whole thing is... is 
Mickelson Morley had a pretty good uh, experiment, which sort of showed. Yeah, I'm well aware of the Mickelson Morley experiment and the ether and all that nonsense, and that's exactly what it is. <clears throat> and if you go down that road, you're never going to get anywhere. First of all, you've got to throw out relativity, you've got to throw out quantum theory, and you've got to start again with the atom from scratch. And it's very, very simple. The, the atom is not an electrical entity. It is electromagnetic. And this is the problem with science today. They can't grasp that the electron is only electric for half the time. They can't explain why a magnetic field appears around a wire when an electric current flows. The 12 great mysteries are real mysteries, which I've addressed, I've set them down, and I, set, I can explain in the book why there are eight shells to the atom, why the shells carry the number of electrons, 2, 8, 18, 32, 32, 18, 8, 2. I can explain why the shells are offset by at least 45 degrees. I can explain why the atom doesn't spring apart. You don't need gluons. I mean, this is bizarre. In 1935... Well, you have a theory, it's a hypothesis of why those things might be true. You have no experimental data there, do you? Do Jack I, I have lots of experimental of data in the book, and it's all been verified by science. Every single step of what I write in the book has already been verified by science. For example, in 2009, a team of scientists at Yale University, uh, the School of Engineering and Applied Science, successfully generated both gravity waves and anti-gravity waves, although they don't know what they've done. What they were doing was they discovered an attractive force of light and showed it could be used to manipulate electrons in semiconducting micro and nano devices. They then split the infrared light beam into two streams, passed one along a transmission line described as a silicon nano wire wire waveguide, delaying its propagation and introducing a phase shift to 180 degrees. This produced the anti-gravity waves. Now, everything in the book is backed up by hard scientific evidence. It's not mine. I've got, there are spiked neutrons that were discovered by the Hahn Mitre Institute in Berlin okay. in 2008. They so what about your Je equation? Where you, where, so you're saying that everything's backed up by scientific evidence of others, even your equation... That, that's the last where, question, by I the way, Reese. correctly, E equals God, because E equals God was certainly never a, a, a part of my mathematical learning. No, well, your learning is about to start, Reese. I didn't say E equals God. What I said was E equals MC squared. Now, God is light. If we look at the literature, all of the spiritual li literature, it doesn't matter if it's the back of okay. the future of the Hindu, or if we, we look at... Gentlemen, uh, gentlemen, we've got to take a, a quick break there. We'll, we'll continue this after the ad break just very quickly, but uh, um, um, bear with us, and we'll be right back after this. The Moore Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. The More Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. Broadcasting from the studios of Radio Cardiff. You're now watching The More Show. Welcome back to the show. I'm still currently joined with my guest, Maurice Cotterell, uh, author of Future Science, Forbidden Science for the 21st Century. Uh, Maurice, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, now, uh, do, do you normally get a lot of um, uh, scientists on the attack then uh, with your work? Because I asked you that before, but yet, yet um, you know, I mean, is that normal? It's normal because they have their own agenda. Uh, physicists get paid billions of dollars every year to look for the cause of gravity. So the last thing they're going to do is find the cause of gravity, and the last thing they're going to do is welcome somebody else from outside finding the cause of gravity. It's like asking Turkey to vote for Christmas. I mean, if they were to do that, then they'd all be on the dole next week. So they dig their heels in. They don't want to see the truth or change. They don't want to understand. They want their ideas to be accepted, and they don't wish to move forward. 
Now, what I had to do in future science was make absolutely sure that every single step of the way had already been verified by orthodox science. Right. And what I've done is put all the pieces together and explain how they work. Okay. Uh, and I'm, I've got to say, it's, it, it is an interesting book. Um, now, let's go straight into the 28-day um, uh, fertility. Well, let, let's go. Let's speak about the the, the sun, the 28-day okay. spinning cycle, and yeah. how it determines. Well, you know, the, 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 the fetus in the womb and, you know, this, this sun sign astrology as well. Yes. Now, uh, again, all of these steps have been discovered scientifically by others. For example, Mariner 2 in 1961, an interplanetary spacecraft in 1962, detected the radiation coming off the sun, the particles, which they call the solar wind. And we know that the sun is made up of two distinct magnetic fields, a north pole dipole field, which is like a bar magnet, And it's also got four bubbles of magnetism spaced around the equator. Now, as the sun spins, these four fields shower off particles towards the Earth every seven days, because it takes 28 days to spin once. And those particles impinge on the Van Allen belts, the belts of radiation, which protect the Earth from the otherwise harmful particles if they were to bombard the Earth directly. The particles... <clears throat> then go from North Pole to South Pole in the van, inside the Van Allen belt of radiation, taking one second to do so. And as they do so, the Earth's magnetic field at ground level becomes modulated. And we know that modulated magnetic fields shake up the DNA in, uh, in developing uh, genes uh, in the ovum inside the womb. So... What I did in 1986 was I discovered that there were 12 types of radiation coming off the sun <coughs> excuse me, okay. every year. Those 12 types of radiation result in 12 magnetic fields per year, which result in 12 types of mutation. And we know going back to psychological experiments from 1907 from one of the first psychologists in Germany called Johannes Lange, uh, he discovered that, or he determined that uh, uh, the uh, personality of the fetus was dependent on heredity and he did that by studies of twins and siblings of twins so putting all these people to uh, all these pieces together what we find is the sun spins every 28 days it gives off a different uh, combination of particles every month that combination uh, changes the magnetic field that magnetic field shakes up different genes so we get 12 types of personality throughout the year the 12 signs of the zodiac If we look at the fertility cycle, again, it's the spinning sun sending out these particles that impinge upon the Van Allen belts. The modulating magnetic fields affect the pituitary, hypothalamus, and pineal gland in females. That affects the amount of oestrogen and progesterone produced, and that affects the fertility directly, the the female menstrual cycle. If we uh, talk about sunspots, the ancient Chinese were among the earliest to uh, have a look at sunspots. And they knew that there was a cycle of approximately 11.5 years that comes and goes. Now, these are black spots on the sun's surface. Uh, The sun, if if you like, is a sort of yellow, amber, orange color, and the spots are a darker brown. And the current belief is that uh, the spots are of a lower temperature. It is, in fact, because they are uh, regions of very intense magnetic field, and the light waves won't go through them, so they appear darker, when, in fact, they're not any lower temperature. Scientists... Orthodox scientists don't know what causes them. I do know what causes them. What happens is the planet Mercury moves, which is next to the sun, moves by 4.1 degrees every day, and that drags the equatorial plasma around the sun 4.1 degrees a day faster than the North Pole and the South Pole of the sun. So this makes the middle of the sun, the equator, go faster. We call this the differential rotation of the sun's magnetic fields. And uh, this causes... A tur- magnetic turbulence inside the sun and bubbles of magnetism burst out of the sun and they appear as spots on the surface. Now, I, when I was working at Cranfield University, I determined two cycles. One, the fundamental cycle is 11.49 years in duration and there's another longer cycle of 187 years. These two cycles mix together to form an even longer cycle of 18,139 years. And during that time, the sun's magnetic field, and we're talking about the sun's neutral sheet, which is the equatorial region of the sun, changes direction five times. And when it changes direction every 3,000 years or so, it causes the Earth to twist on its axis sometimes. Sometimes it just causes the magma inside the Earth to tilt inside the Earth, which 
causes the earth to get hotter, causes the oceans to boil from below, it causes global warming and global cooling. So there are all these mechanisms. And we know with long-term sunspot cycles that take place over thousands of years, yes. that the sun gives off uh, x-rays which cause miscarriages during sunspot minimums. And uh, during a sunspot minimum, when we get few spots on the sun, we get lower fertility, lower production of oestrogen and progesterone. So civilizations decline, especially in the equatorial regions. And uh, also we get less rainfall during a sunspot minimum. So that, we get, that leads to drought, food shortages, and again, uh, equatorial civilizations are hit more than most. Now, what we have to remember is that all of the ancient sun-worshipping civilizations believed that the sun was the god of fertility, the sun was the god of astrology. So I started to study the ancient sun-worshipping civilization of the Maya in Central America. Now, their classic civilization reached a peak at about A.D. 750 uh, in the Central American region of Palenque, which is in the Yucatan Peninsula. And there's a very interesting pyramid there called the Pyramid of Inscriptions. And when I went down to look at the Pyramid of Inscriptions, I was absolutely fascinated by what had been discovered by archaeologists since 1952. And it was at that time that an archaeologist, a Mexican archaeologist called Alberto Rue, discovered a secret staircase going down into the pyramid that led to a tomb. And inside the tomb at the bottom of the pyramid, in uh, the steps, there was a stone sarcophagus with a, a lid, a, fine, a, a, a very ornately carved five-ton limestone lid, which I have called the lid of Palenque. And this, in fact, this wonderful piece of uh, masonry uh, explains why we live, why we die, what God is, what hell is, what the devil is. Uh, what, you know, it explains everything we need to know about life. But first of all, we have to break the code of the amazing lid of Palenque. Now, what we have to do is uh, take a photocopy of the line drawing, then we have to colour in certain areas, like painting by numbers. Yeah. Then uh, we take a f another photocopy, a transparent photocopy, lay the two onto each other, and rotate them about a common ep epicentre. And the instructions to do this are contained in the border code around the drawing. So it's not hit and miss, it's not conjecture, it's not hypothesis. There's a three-step decoding process. It's like the Rosetta Stone, which because you have the same information in three different languages, it cannot be speculation. It's got to be what it purports to be. It was encoded information 1,250 years ago, and by using the decoding process, we can come up with these hidden pictures. Now, the head of uh, Little Palenque has more than 100 secret pictures which are obtained using this process. And, of course, some people object to this, saying, well, they didn't have transparencies in A.D. 750. Well, they didn't need transparencies then, because what they did was store one image in the left-hand side of the brain. They then generated the image in the right-hand side of the brain. They then used the brain to manipulate the two pieces, and that produced the composite decoded picture. Now, we can't do this today because we're stupid. Now, of course, clearly at first, most people said, but these people are primitive. They couldn't possibly have done that. But, of course, it wasn't all of the Mayas who were capable of this kind of uh, manipulation of graphic material. It was one man, Lord Pekal. And it's just like Jesus was capable of walking on the water 2,000 years ago in Judea. It wasn't all of the Israelis that could walk on the water or turn water into wine. It was one man, a miracle maker. And what we find with Lord Pekal as we decode the stories and the pictures, he tells us that he was a reincarnation of Jesus, that he was born long ago. Now, there is, there's more than one link. There's many, many links. For example, Lord Pekal tells us that he was born in a stable. He grew up, uh, died on a cross made of two pieces of wood, and when he died, he became the planet Venus. Now, the last page of the Bible, Jesus says, I am Venus, the brightest and purest source of light in the heavens. I am the morning star and the evening star. So there we have an agreement between the information left behind by Jesus and Lord Pekal. And the more we start to get into these secret pictures, we learn more and more about Lord Pekal, which is derived from Pascal, the Roman Catholic word, which itself is derived from Pasach, the Hebrew, which refers to the Passover. So Lord Pekal is the same as Pascal, which refers to the Christian word for Easter. Okay. Okay. 
and, and I'm very conscious of time here and how much we've got to get through as well. And um, we've been we've been placing those slides on the uh, the, the system as as uh, as uh, as you've been discussing that as well. Very very interesting as well. You know, and one of those slides, it, it it looked like some guy, you know, sat on some sort of. Uh, a spaceship, but I mean, maybe I was just seeing it with the with di- with different eyes. You know, the the the, the one where it seems yes. to be sort of riding some sort of apparatus with the tubes going in into his in, in into his face. But now uh, that's what Eric von Däniken suggested yeah, in the sixties. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it's not. As I say, it's yeah. not a guy in a spaceship. No. It's the Bible of the Maya, the long lost Bible of the Maya, called okay. the Popol Vuh. Okay. It's referred to in various ancient books of the Maya. Okay. So. <laughs> It, that's a, it's a very, very high-tech, complicated drawing. It is. That can only be decoded using transparencies. Ab- abs- absolutely. And, and very quickly, very quickly, I mean, I mean, do you believe in a, that there was ancient civilizations that were uh, advanced as well? I mean... Absolutely, but they were, they weren't, it wasn't the civilization per se. It was the leader of the civilization, Lord Paykal for the Mayas. Okay. It was Viracocha for the Peruvians. It was Tutankhamun, the son of God, for the Egyptians. It was Qin Shi Huangdi, the leader of the ancient Chinese in 220 BC. Uh, these, all of these leaders were miracle makers. They were all the same spiritual energy that comes to Earth to teach mankind of the higher orders of science and spirituality. And it was these super brains that uh, built the pyramids of Egypt and built the pyramids of Mexico and Peru and uh, that encoded all of this information for us to decode for ourselves as we uh, progressed and we became more intelligent and we began to develop computers and stuff like this. Okay, okay. Now, uh, very quickly getting into it, um, you know, what is God, and God and, is and what what is that? What is our purpose in the universe? Okay, now it's not for me to tell anybody what God is. None of this stuff is my material. I've just decoded it from these sure. ancient civilizations, and so we can get a cross fix from each of them, and we know the information is good. Now the Bible said, "In the beginning there was God, and God said, let there be light." So we can start with light, if you like, because in the Bhagavad Gita, the Indian holy book, it it quite categorically says God is light. Well, now we know that light is electromagnetic energy, and electromagnetic energy is voltage. So God is voltage. So if we look at Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, what we see is on the left we have energy E. So that must be God, because God is energy, electromagnetic energy. So God must equal mc squared, which is mass, multiplied by the speed of light squared. Now, this is Einstein's equation for uh, the atom bomb, if you like. He never knew that at the time. It wasn't until 1938 when Otto Frisch in Germany discovered that there was a lot of energy in this equation and it would produce an atom bomb. But if we look at it in a spiritual way, what we find is that in the beginning there was God. Let's call God a million volts on the left-hand side of Einstein's equation. So that equals mc squared. Now, God made man in his own image. So man cannot grow unless he sacrifices a piece of himself, a sperm or an ovum, and an apple tree cannot grow unless it sacrifices an apple. It cannot grow beyond a certain point, the size of the tree, for example. The only known mechanism of growth in the physical world, therefore, is associated with sacrifice. Now, God can do anything, it seems, except grow. Now, God is good and God is love, so the only thing better than God is more God, which is more love, which is more good, so the universe becomes a better place. But God cannot grow without sacrifice because he made himself in in our image, a man in his image, excuse me. So what this means is that God created the physical universe to allow himself to grow. And he did this by sacrificing, if you like, a piece of himself. So in the beginning, let's say God was a million volts. He he converted, say, 200,000 volts, which went across Einstein's equation and became minus 200,000 volts. That then uh, became the Big Bang and turned into mass in a ratio in accordance with the speed of light, which is a very large explosion. That's how the universe began. But now what we find is on the left we have God who is 800,000 volts, and on the right we have everything on the right is negative, which is the opposite of God. This tells us that everything in the physical universe must be the opposite of God. So the stars, the planets, the trees, human beings must be the devil. And everything on the other side of the equation, which is E, energy, must be God. So we've got the two sides of the equation there. Now clearly at this stage of the analysis, God hasn't grown. 
So there's more to this than where we are at the moment. So we've got to figure out if God wants to grow and he sacrifices a piece of himself, the energy turns into the physical universe, how does that get God to grow? Well then, once the physical universe has been uh, created, time begins. Until that moment, there's no such thing as time. Time does not uh, exist in the spiritual world. It only exists in the physical world. And we have, uh, the planets are formed, we have night, we have day, we have evolution, you know, the fish turn into the birds, the birds turn into uh, mammals and so on. And uh, mankind develops a brain. It, devel- it develops voltages in his nervous system, in the womb. And that, don't forget, mankind is in the physical world, so he is negatively charged. So let's say mankind, a, a baby, produces minus 5 volts in its brain, across its brain as it develops in the womb. Well, that minus 5 volts will drag plus 5 volts off God in heaven to neutralize the voltage. So it drags a piece of godly energy down, and the plus five volts it drags down from God is a soul. So the soul of plus meets the body, which is minus, the two cancel out, and we become a human being, half God, half devil. Then what happens is, is if I love you, my voltage grows. So when I die, I go back to God, and God grows. If I hate you, then when I die, my voltage goes down. Well, clearly, God doesn't want his, my soul back if it's gone lower. So the, the, the voltage of the soul is not great enough to escape the Earth's gravity or the magnetic field of the Earth. So it reincarnates into a butterfly or a worm or a dog. So what we see is that every living thing is God in disguise. So God is half of a human being. The physical part of the human being is the devil. It's made from carbon atoms, which is 666, the mark of the beast and the devil. Six electrons, six protons, six neutrons. But once the energy is released from the body, it, it either goes back to God or the Mayas tell us about the underworlds or about purgatory where the soul is purged. All of this information was left behind in secret pictures by the Mayas, Lord Pekal, by Tutankhamun, the Son of God, yeah. by Jesus, the Son of God, by Chin Shi Huang Di, the Son of Heaven, by Lord Krishna of the, the Brahmas, uh, which is uh, Greek for Christos, the Christ, just like Jesus. What we get is this uh, correspondence between all of these leaders of all of these civilizations. It's the same spiritual energy coming back to tell us how to get to heaven, how to avoid getting to hell, and what God is, what heaven is, what hell is. And it's very straightforward. Okay. Well, um, um, uh, Maurice, uh, what is your website, please, as well? It's www.mauricecotterell.com. And it's got all of these, it's got samples of all of these pictures uh, up there. You can see the decoded images for yourself. Uh, And uh, download the stuff on gravity and uh, examine it. If you can find fault, I'd love to hear it. (laughs) Well, (laughs) well, what we'll do is we're going to link that on our website as well. So, uh, and all the slides as you were discussing that were coming coming up as well. So, uh, well, Maurice, uh, thank you so much for joining us. It's been very, very fascinating, and I'd love to get you back on when we go into syndication, which will be uh, in the next couple of months. So um, if you just stay, stay with us, and, and I'll speak to you in the ad break, but thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome, Kevin. Okay, coming up on the second half of the show, I'll be speaking to Lucid Dreamer and author Robert Wagner, so stay tuned. Visit themoreshow.co.uk forward slash shop to purchase products and services from your favourite past guests. If you're new to this site, you can also catch up on the previous television and radio shows through YouTube and The More Show website. 